did my military, retired, like I said, and now I do consulting. Um, you've probably heard my name throughout the Air Force, um, probably not in a positive light, because I tend to um, say what's on my mind uh, in terms of PFAS exposure, firefighters, and everything. So I've, I've ruffled some feathers, uh, I don't deny that. Um, but it's, it's so you guys can continue working safe, you guys can go home to your families, live out long lives. Um, so um, my career started in 91, uh, went to Chinook, an old school. Uh, yep, uh, that's ground zero really for firefighters out there when it comes to uh, HFOF exposure, PFAS. Uh, Agent Orange and all kinds of stuff that, that's out of Chinook. <clears throat> uh, from there, went to Cannon Air Force Base, Clovis, New Mexico. That's another disaster site uh, in terms of exposure. Uh, got out for six years, went back to PA, was a deputy sheriff, a couple other jobs back there for a little bit. Came back in in 2021, went to Davis Monthan, um, then Ramstein Air Base, Germany, got picked up as an instructor over at Silver Flag, uh, then came back to Langley was uh, there for about a year, deployed to Iraq. He said, hey, you're going to Air Combat Command. I said, no, no, I'm not. Um, had no choice. They sent me up to ACC. Was there for 10 years, flew under the radar. Uh, worked for Randy Carrick and Chia. Um, did a lot of great things there. And, and uh, like I said, then I, I retired, worked at the Pentagon for about a six months at that before the contract ran out for, for Air Force Fire. Um, and I worked remote. They said, hey, you can move back to PA. And I'm like, sure. Move back there. Actually, quit quit that job and started up my own consulting. So that's what I do now. I you know, try to travel around and, and, and deal with this. We're dealing a lot with it up in up in Pennsylvania. Um, they're making some changes up there. So <clears throat> I'm also a uh, state fire instructor up in Pennsylvania. Uh, I'm on uh, the new NFPA 1010 committee. Um, so the firefighter qualifications. You're going to see some changes with that. Uh, I'm on the EFSA committee for. Uh, the new support personnel, um, so you'll see that come out as well. That's going to be part of 1010. So, some things are changing. I'm glad to be part of it. Um, just glad to be able to give back to um, you know, what the military has given me and the fire service. So, uh, we're going to burn through some slides here. This is, like I said, it's about a four hour presentation, but I want to bore you guys. Um, I do appreciate some back and forth. So, if you see something, question, feel free to stop me. Say, hey, stop where I went on. I got a question about this. And, We'll just have a, a discussion about, uh, about PFAS and stuff. So, um, legal disclaimer: I've had to put this in um, in my slides. I'm not an attorney. Uh, I can't give any legal advice. Um, so, whatever you see in here is my opinions, based on information that I've received um, and, and validated through my channels and everything like that. So, um, just don't sue me. <laughs> we'll go through. Lies. So we talk about PFAS. How big of a problem do you guys think PFAS is? No idea. Probably no bigger idea. Than what we can imagine. No idea. Bigger than you can imagine. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's a, that's a fair answer. Um, we look at this map. This is this is the presumptive contamination sites. So as you see, the red is industrial facilities. Uh, it's predominantly in the in the. Uh, the east and, and the, you know the, the mid Atlantic Midwest uh, areas on that. Um, we look at the the, the blue uh, military sites. They're estimating three thousand four hundred ninety three military sites. Now that's active and former. So you look at Chinook, like I said, that's a former site. Uh, we know it's there. It's not suspected. But if you hear what the DoD is saying right now, they're they're estimating about seven hundred locations, but they're only saying it in the United States. They're not talking about overseas yet. Um, once you start, and, and these maps are just with the, the US, obviously. Once you go on a global scale, it is, this stuff's everywhere. Um, you know, just looking around this room, this carpeting has PFAS in it. Your uniforms have PFAS in it. Um, the TV, the phones, all that stuff has, has PFAS chemicals in it uh, because there's about 12,000 PFAS chemicals out there. We know of probably a dozen or so in the fire service. Um, so once they start making things, we really don't know what's in there until we do independent testing, and that's expensive. <clears throat> oh, 
over 57,000 sites across America presumed to be contaminated with PFAS. Why do you think we presume? We haven't tested them all. We haven't tested them all. Nope. Like I said, the products that we have, and they keep making products out there every day um, that have PFAS in it, manufacturers are not required uh, to divulge what's in their products um, because of industry trade secrets. There's no, PFAS is not, it's not a regulated chemical, so they're not required to report it. Um, now your states, I, I don't know what Georgia's doing, but in Pennsylvania, they, they just established an NCL, maximum containment level or containment level. Um, they went off the old EPA 70 parts per trillion. EPA has now reduced that down to four parts per trillion. So the old MCL, I think they have it like at 14 and 16 parts per trillion in drinking water. It's still high. Uh, we're trying to get that lowered. Um, I wrote a huge public comment on that uh, to try to get it narrowed down. And again, I'm using evidence from around the country and everything. So that they have to look at every public comment. By all that, they gotta do it. So when I wrote a Tom Clancy novel, had all, all the information in there, they did respond back uh, and actually adopted some of, some of the stuff that I said in their decision to go to 14 and 16. But now I'm gonna write another Tom Clancy novel to get them down to the four parts per trillion. Uh, and that's still high as well. So <clears throat> if anybody asks you what normal PFAS level is, it's zero, because it's man-made. It's not naturally occurring. It should not be in our bodies. Really, it shouldn't be in anything. Um, it's a it's a known carcinogen. It's a known toxin. Um, so if anybody says, "Hey, what's a normal level in your blood?" Zero is what it is. So, and we'll we'll get to that throughout here. <clears throat> what do you guys think uh, is considered contamination or contaminated? As far as what? Just in general. Well, when you, yeah, when you hear when you hear the word PFAS and contaminated or contamination, what do you think that is? Water. Yeah. Water is a big one. Yeah. Um, so consumables. Consumables. Over, yeah, over a certain threshold. Can, yeah. can yourselves be contaminated? Yes. Absolutely. And I hate to say it, but probably everybody in here has been contaminated with PFAS uh, to some degree. Definitely. Definitely. Yeah. Definitely. Especially with A triple F. Yep. I mean, so this is pretty significant, the impact of just one drop. So one parts per trillion uh, is the equivalent to one drop of impurity. And this comes from the U.S. Navy. Uh, one drop of impurity in 500,000 barrels of water. <clears throat> or you take one drop of PFAS, a pollutant, uh, it, <clears throat> it'll likely pollute 21 million gallons of water. So you take an eyedropper, it'll bloop, like that, it'll contaminate 21 million gallons of water. Because that's <clears throat> when you start doing uh, the mathematics on it. <clears throat> As you see, uh, one U.S. barrel is 42 gallons. So one drop of impurity, 32 Olympic size swimming holes, is equivalent to 21 million gallons of water. And then if you want to start looking at drinking water, 336 million eight ounce glasses of water taken from the same source. So um, when we hear the EPA say, oh, 70 parts per trillion is supposed to be safe. Um, think about, you know, that's, that's 70 drops in, in the water. Now, the EPA, they say, okay, 70 parts per trillion, when they, when they first established it, everybody was supposed to be able to consume 70 parts per trillion every day for the rest of their life, and it would have no adverse health effects. I call bullshit on that because we know it doesn't take much with PFAS, um, and that's the that's the weird stuff about it is that everybody in this room we could all be equally slimed with with PFAS, but everybody here never develops cancer. I end up developing four different types of cancer. That's just the way the human body is, and we'll talk about this um, because we don't know what the underlying conditions are. You know, everybody in here probably has an underlying condition you don't know anything about, uh, but because PFAS is an immune suppressant, once your immune system becomes uh, compromised, now that allows those cancer cells that are in our body uh, and other diseases to go ahead and 
rear their ugly head and say, hey, I'm going to attack your liver, I'm going to attack your kidneys, I'm going to attack your thyroid. Um, so that's the, that's the risk about, uh, about this. And firefighters, we're at a greater risk of developing those than, than the average person. <clears throat> this is what a uh, million gallons looks like. Um, so 50 foot wide, 267 feet long, um, you know, 50 or you, you know, if you do a cube, 51.1 feet per side. If you want a really good picture, that's the Boeing Everett factory up in Washington. It would take 2.6 of those factories um, volume uh, equivalent to, to, for just one drop of, of PFAS. So you could actually fill up about two and a half of those factories of water, uh, go boop with one drop of, of pollutant, and that's what your contamination would be. So it's, it's pretty significant. When I was down at Congress a couple years ago, they had some water set out. We did a presentation, and I look at all the it was pretty much all the staff members. I think we had one member of Congress decided to show up. And uh, we had talked about drinking water contaminated. And jokingly, I said, one of those glasses or one of those bottles of water has PFAS contamination in it. Do you know which one it is? And there were some folks drinking water and they sort of said, you know, because <laughs> like, you don't know unless you test it. So it's. This is Canada Air Force Base, close to Mexico. I was there in 91 to 95. Um, unknowingly, uh, I was part of the pollution that was there. Uh, you guys know the routine when we did ops checks. We'd go out, spray foam every day. Um, you know, didn't matter what day it was. Uh, up and down the flight line, up and down the runways, uh, all over the base. The blue arrow is where the fire training pit is. The yellow arrow is the Highland Dairy Farm. Um, that's Art Shaft. He is now pretty much out of business because of what we did at Cannon Air Force Base. He's had to euthanize uh, well over 4,000 of his cows. He has to dump his milk out. He can't sell it. Uh, he's lost uh, well over between 10 and 13 million dollars. Laid off 40 plus personnel. Um, he's done. His dairy farm is done. He's just stringing them along, um, you know, trying to, to, to get whatever income he can out of that facility. Uh, he's got high levels of PFAS, uh, his family does. The Air Force, um, he's currently suing the federal government because of it. Um, the Air Force came in and said, okay, because of the drinking wells that are polluted, we're gonna give you some water. Um, they did that for about six months and then took the pallets of water away. So he's on his own. So there's a lot of, there's a lot of, and this is Art right here. Um, that's his cows. Um, He's literally right next to the, the perimeter fence at Canada Air Force Base. That's how close his farm is. Um, so yeah, he's, like I said, he, he's pretty well done. Um, yeah, it, it's, it's a sad situation. The DOD has come out, provided letters notifying about 4,500 farms across the country um, of PFAS contamination that has either came from military installations or sludge, uh, we're finding that uh, as well. So when you, when you have your drinking water and it goes down into the, the sanitary sewer system, it goes to the, the wastewater treatment facility. Because these facilities cannot filter PFAS, it goes straight through into their sludge pits and then that sludge is sold to farms to apply it onto their their fields so it's, it's a form of a fertilizer um, you know whether PFAS is in there or not all that sludge that's in your in your wastewater treatment facilities sewer treatment facilities that's getting spread out on farm fields so if it contains PFAS uh, especially if it's a crop you're consuming that that sludge uh, and we're seeing this in farms all across the country this is the underground aquifer system that was there. Um, again, Canon tested about 27,000 parts per trillion of PFAS back in 2018. We know this through right to know requests um, for the, uh, the, water, uh, the water tests and everything like that. So you see where Canon is, uh, the question mark is, is way down there around where uh, Art Shaft's area is. Um, but, that's, that's polluted for, for life. There, there's, no way, there's no way to clean up an aquifer 
Um, you can install filtration systems, but that aquifer system is destroyed for eternity uh, because of PFAS. It, it just, it, it remains in the environment. There's no way, there's no magic pill, excuse me, there's no magic pill, there's nothing that will break it down uh, naturally. This is Langley Air Force Base. Uh, the yellow area, that was my last assignment. Yellow area is the fire training area. Um, the uh, fire department's down there, um, down towards the south there. Uh, they only had one station on the main base. Virginia? Yep. Oh, okay. Yep, Langley. I know that training center. Yep. So what do you notice uh, about that's encompassing about two thirds of the base? Water. The river. Water. I know it's exactly where it is. I grew up there. Did you? Okay. So what do you think happens with all that PFAS um, that's coming from the fire training area? Where do you think it went? Right into the water. water. Right into the water. So any given day, I could sit there in the shore and watch guys dropping crab pots, fishing, and where do you think that, that seafood went? He knows. Mm -hmm. Right down to a local seafood market. So now you got consumers down there unknowingly consuming PFAS laced seafood. Never thought about that. And to date, despite my repeated interviews with local news stations down there, the base is not, and I'm not here slamming the military, um, just state the facts. Um, the base has not said anything about the PFAS contamination. So, how bad are some military installations? Well, these are the top five uh, that have over one million parts per trillion of contamination. Now, the old England Air Force Base in Louisiana, that's the, that's the winner. 20 million parts per trillion of PFAS contamination. That former site is now a uh, residential area. It's a industrial area. Um, they basically took that place redevelop it into a working civilian community. Uh, the airport is still active there, um, but there's 20.7 million parts per trillion of contamination. Langley, 2.2. I was there for 10 years, not one person said, hey, there's a lot of contamination here, until we found this, the, the test results. Like I said, if you're right to know. And what are you, what are you actually testing to get these like ground water or like? So they drill, they drill wells um, okay. in different areas. So some of these wells are right there at the fire training area. Um, so they go down, they could go down 30 feet, could go down a couple hundred feet. Um, if they're detecting it at a couple hundred feet, that's an issue. Uh, we get it, you know, surface level and stuff like that. But once you start getting into deep wells and you're finding this, that PFAS is finding its way deeper and deeper into, into aquifer systems. Um, and of course, you know. It just goes downstream. Yep, yep. Um, you, know, you know how water is. If you find a leak, it's gonna find the path of least resistance and it's gonna go that way. Uh, because PFAS is a surfactant, it's designed to go ahead and slide over things. It makes it a lot easier to travel uh, underground, so. So what's, what's interesting, the second one, Naval Weapon Station China Lake. What's unique about that place, other than it's a weapons test station? No. You guys probably haven't heard of this. This is where they're currently, or have recently tested, the six new fluorine-free foams for the fire service and the military. They went out to China Lake. Why, I don't know, but there's already 8 million parts per trillion of contamination out there, so now they just spread more foam on top of the contamination. So that's coming down the pipe. They're, you guys will be switching over to a non-fluorinated foam. Um, it was supposed to occur next year. I'm hearing stuff through my channels. Uh, the DOD's already looking at putting in uh, one-year exemptions uh, to that requirement. They want to keep pushing it back because the word the word that I've heard um, is that because it's a non-fluorinated foam, it's got a different viscosity, um, so it may not work in your current apparatus. Um, so they're looking at apparatus manufacturers have actually come back and said, yeah, our systems are designed for HFOF. If you try putting a, a thicker viscosity in there, it's not gonna work. So you're either gonna have to replace the truck or retrofit the truck, and some of their apparatus you can't retrofit. So they're like, you're gonna be spending millions of dollars on a new truck. And this new foam doesn't have any PFAS in it, correct? 
right? Supposedly. Supposedly, but every phone has PFAS in it. We've done test, well, not me, but some of my, my colleagues, uh, researchers out there, they've done testing and found trace elements of, of PFAS in it. Again, there's 12,000 PFAS chemicals out there. So, yeah. um, what we've also found is because it's a non fluorinated phone, depending on the fuels that you have, and I dealt with this with the European community last year, um, had some discussions with them. The, the fuel manufacturers were, were pushing back. They, they want to keep AFFF because it's an all-inclusive. It's a one, one and done phone. If you go to a non-fluorinated phone, this phone may only work on three different types of fuels. This phone will work on three other different types of phones. This phone will work on three other different types of phones. So you may need to have three or more different types of non-fluorinated phone on your, on your facility. And that's why fuel manufacturers are like, We've got all these different types of fuels. You want us to set up different systems for all of this. It's going to be way too costly. HFF is cheap. It's a one and done. So they're pushing back hard to keep HFF out of there. So that's something to think about. Keep it on your radar as, as you switch over to these non fluorinated phones. Um, not significantly longer, but it does take longer. Uh, you need more. You need more foam. Um, your whole system is going to need to be redone. What I've heard, has it, have you guys heard about your, your, your switch over yet? No. They no they're we, working on it. They're working on it. Yeah, that's all we know they're working on it. It's supposed to be coming. Because I had, I had another facility, another installation, um, I won't name who it is. They've got the word down, instead of the triple rinse, they're only going to do a single rinse. Uh, we already know the triple rinse doesn't work because there's still a foam stuck in, in the tanks. They go to a single rinse, it's gonna leave a lot of foam left over, plus it doesn't clean out the pipe, you're only draining the tank. So think about all that residual C6 foam that's in. It's already in the system, unless you flush that out, if you put a different type of foam in and you run it through, now you've mixed non-fluorinated foam with fluorinated foam. And I've always said, if I was that non-fluorinated foam manufacturer, I'd be pushing back because if somebody decides to test it, they're going to come back to that non-fluorinated foam manufacturer and say, hey, your stuff has PFAS in it. So they're going to be like, no, it doesn't. Your truck is contaminated. Um, so, And then the, on the other thing, too, is that you guys probably haven't been really, well, you haven't for the past couple of years, used foam uh, for exercises. So think about all those new guys coming through tech school that have never experienced how to use properly applied foam. They're going to be out there spraying this stuff all over the place. You're going to be going through a lot of the non fluorinated foam um, just to get your, your tactics down. So that's, that's going to be another issue. Um, PFAS is the problem. Who are the problem solvers and the solution creators? Great question. Not the manufacturers. <laughs> Not the manufacturers. <laughs> that's why they're currently getting sued by everybody. So, incident commander, chiefs, are you guys the problem solvers, solution providers? I'm just trying to keep exposure to them. That's, that's, that's all you can do right now, yep. EMS, um, why, why should they be concerned about PFAS contamination? Well, if you're dealing with a patient that's contaminated. Patient's contaminated, it's in everything. Underlying condition underlying conditions. So they, they sort of got to get spun up on PFAS. So if somebody starts exhibiting different signs and symptoms, um, they start asking questions. What are the signs and symptoms? You really, you really don't see anything externally. It's more internal, um, and that's through lab testing, x-rays, all, all that stuff is where you know, you're going to see that. I mean, when I really think about it, it could be, it could be resistance to simple medical treatment. Mm -hmm. it, it could resist uh, antibiotics, it could resist, because we don't know. Right. Yeah, so every treatment that could be normal, if you have PFAS exposure in your body, uh, or the level of PFAS in your body, we got it, uh, it could interact me differently than it interacts with him, with the same illness. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Immune intensifier, mm -hmm. immune suppressor. Yeah. And, and that's what we're seeing with, with the immune suppressant. Is <coughs> how does your um, how do you react to vaccines? Mm -hmm. you know, we, we saw this, you know, with, with different vaccines out there. It's like, okay, 
you know, you're you're not warding off the you know whatever you got vaccinated for. Mm -hmm. So people, you know, especially doctors in the medical community, they need to start asking that question. Especially firefighters, when you come in, you get a vaccine, you know, say a flu vaccine, you're still you're still getting the flu or cold or whatever. It's like, well, you know, start asking questions. You know, why? Why are you still getting sick? Oh, because I was exposed to PFAS and it's likely my immune you know, system's uh, been compromised. So. That was me during the, the PFAS conference. Uh, I had quite a few uh, individuals from, from all over. What about these folks? Are they problem solvers? <laughs> problem creators? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. They can yeah. balance the budget. Yeah, that's, that. I love that reaction. All right, so these are just some of the consumer products. We know firefighting foam. Um, you guys don't use proximity suits anymore, do you? No. no. All right. uh, I've seen some photos out there in the Air Force pages. They're still use, using the, the shrouds and everything. Um, why, I don't know. It doesn't, you know, some folks are like, well, because of the J fire, the, the cancer. I'm like, do you guys realize those cancers aren't rated for heat? So you're not even supposed to be taking them into a fire. So the, the shields do nothing other than trap the heat in there and compromise the cancer, so. Um, little interesting thing I did when I was over at Silverfly, the J, the J fire suits, the J lo suits that we had, uh, you know those are, Flammable. So I, I, I literally took them out of the out of the package during the silver flag class. Brand new, out of the package. I took a big lighter on the bottom of the pan. Oh yeah, the, uh, the actual. Uh, the, yeah, that's what yeah, the ensemble. Yeah, yeah, the ensemble. Yeah, the ensemble. That yeah. was the thing. It was like, why do we need cotton under? Uh, why, can, why do we need cotton PT gear or whatever underneath a flammable? Yep. You know, um, ensemble. Yeah. And then you got your gear on top of that. So they were, that's what yeah. they were actually fighting us about. It's like, why can't you just use regular PT? Because we're like, we have to have cotton PT gear or, you know, to wear underneath yeah. the ensemble. And it's like, well, the ensemble is fine little shit. Yeah. So, yeah. you know. Well, the thing, the thing too with the, the cotton undergarments and everything, that, that was a whole NFPA thing. Yeah. You know, oh, you know, you got to wear cotton and everything like that. And it's like, volunteer firefighters don't wear it. We don't see them burning up. You know, paid firefighters, I get it with your uniform, but they were sort of mixing the whole uniform with wildland fire. And so you go out and you do a wildland fire, whatever, you're wearing cotton, so they don't want, you know, polyester or whatever out there on a, on a wildland fire. So it's sort of steering away, it's, a lot of the departments are steering away from the cotton, um, you know, the 100% the, the cotton. They, they did it with the, the military uniforms as, as well. And, you know. Yeah, that was, we had to have 100% Cotton. Yep. Yeah. ABUs. Yep. And uh, yeah, they uh, they did not like that. Mm -hmm. Not for that at all. No. Nope. They're they're just so mad at us for what we had to have. And yeah. So a a trip web. Um, it was invented by the U.S. Navy back in the '60s. Uh, if you're familiar with the USS Forstall incident, um, aircraft carrier had multiple bombs blow up on the carrier. They didn't have a trip well at the time. They didn't have any fire suppression systems. So all that fuel as the, the deck became compromised, all that fuel from the planes got down into the, the bulk of the ship, burned up a lot of the, the sailors, uh, did a lot of damage down in there. They said had they had a trip well at the time, an installed system, they would have saved a lot more lives, saved a lot more property. So the Navy said immediately, we got to go ahead and, and, and develop something. So they actually still own the patent or have the patent on HFF, uh, but because the military doesn't produce anything like that, they farmed it out to 3M and then 3M turned into DuPont and other, other manufacturers. It's been a known toxin uh, by the US military since the 1970s. Uh, the Air Force actually did fish kill studies on this. Uh, we've got the reports on those. And then a decade later, they did lab animals and found HFF caused tumors. Um, now, it's a lot easier when you start looking at lab mice and animals um, to detect how much dosage it takes to kill them or cause tumors because they can actually engineer these mice to be PFAS free. In humans, we're exposed to it every day. Like I said, the stuff that we wear, you know, your cookware, all that stuff. So we already have PFAS in our bodies. So it's, it's hard to do a study on somebody because you already have PFAS in there. 
So you don't know how much dosage to give somebody before you see a tumor or something else show up. Um, were you guys told HFO is just soap and water? Yes. Yep. Yes. yep. <clears throat> yes. That was always safe. Yep. Block three, Chinook, that was the first thing. They said, oh, it's just soap and water, it's perfectly fine. Water, refractometer test. Yep. Uh, when people leave, we douse them with it. We used to use it to wash the trucks on the P15, get some in the bucket. Yep. It's, it, and I tell folks, I said, it is a great degreaser if you want to clean your garage stalls or anything like that. A little way trip yeah, left down, some, rub it, and clean, clean that stuff floor, right off. Yeah. Everything yeah. from trucks to the floor. Because it's a, it's a surfactant. That's what surfactants are designed to do, is degrease. So a lot of your cleaning products have PFAS in it. So when you're using cleaning products, make sure you get your PPD on. Because otherwise, if you spray your hand, inhale it, that's PFAS going in your body. Never told me where it was. Yep. No, no, we, we sprayed kids, Canada Air Force Base. We sprayed kids with HFWF because it was <laughs> snow. You know, it was like you're in the middle of New Mexico. Oh, look at the cool stuff. Yeah, no. What about high expansion foam? Is that got a lot of PFAS as well? Or is... You're going to see that here in a second. Okay. So um, it contains toxic ingredients. And it's funny because on my LinkedIn, gentleman that works with high expansion foam, I think he's part of the manufacturing. He came back and he said, oh, it, it's a detergent. That's, that's how it's supposed to be. Yeah, it's like soap. Yeah, what they yeah well, until you see the little block down there, unknown toxic ingredients. This is what's currently in Air Force aircraft hangers. Ansel Jet X 2% high expansion foam. Unless you guys have drained it from your system. Yeah, we're off. We don't, we don't have it. But okay. I got a picture of me walking through it. Okay. After I Yeah. Before. So you were probably exposed to this. And at 39.298% ingredients of unknown toxicity. Again, manufacturers are not required to divulge that because industry trade secrets. Well, I think they pretty much are killing that everywhere because it's it's like put out no fires and kill 13 people. So I think they're really getting rid of, well, what I heard was high expensive foam was getting, it, uh, it is. They're, they're getting rid of it everywhere. Basically. They are. So here's something interesting. Over the past 15 years, 84 mishaps, because you know the military doesn't have accidents, they have mishaps, mm -hmm. right? So there was only 84 reported, 120 aircraft damage, one fatality, and that was the guy down in Florida, the contractor that decided to come off the off the uh, catwalk, and then the elevator walked out into the, into the foam, got lost. Can't breathe, yeah. Yep, had a heart attack. Uh, 21 persons injured. The only aircraft fuel-related fire in the past 32 years was extinguished using a water deluge system. HRF system never saved an aircraft. Yeah. They could have damaged more aircraft than it did save them. Yeah, because it gets in all the, yep. all the spots. Yeah. So what, what the DOD is currently doing now, um, there's a new floor system. Um, made, it's manufactured in Texas. Um, I went down, they actually invited me down to take a look at it. It's a great system. So it, it captures all of this fuel, puts it, in, and it has a, a water mist. So once it gets in there, it detects it. Once that pump kicks on, the water mist kicks in, it shoves all that fuel into a self-contained system. Even if it's on fire, um, it'll, it'll take this, this running fuel that's on fire, collect it, extinguish it, put it into a self-contained system, um, and that fire was out. They did a small test fire. Fire was out in a minute 30 seconds before the fire department could even show up. Um, so. But that's if you have that's fuel only. That's fuel only. So you know that's that's if you get an aircraft that's in a hangar that's that's leaking fuel and is on fire. Um, that's not saying the aircraft is going to be out. Aircraft's still going to be on fire. Uh, but that running fuel, it's a means to collect it. Somehow they convinced the DoD uh, to go to this system. They're installing it in different hangars uh, around the country. NFPA has picked up on it. So now, instead of a installed high expansion foam system, you can use this in floor system. And there's, it's designed that it can either go on top of your current um, concrete pad, or if you want, you can chunk it out and have it flat. Uh, so you're not driving it. It's just a short little ramp up on top. Um, a lot of a lot of helicopter bases are, are switching over to it now. Uh, cool system. Well, like I said, if the, if the aircraft or 
the platform's on fire, it's still going to show off. Um, from what I've heard, all aircraft hangars within the Air Force um, are, are shut down or, or either going to this system. You can't use a trip weapon anymore. The only one that can, what I heard, is Air Force One, um, those, those hangars um, that, can, that can use a trip weapon. They don't trust that core system yet. So, here's the Florian Free Firefighting Foams. Uh, like I said, they're going to replace the Legacy. Uh, they've been around for about 20 years. So, why the Air Force decided they want to test uh, a new a new Florian Free Foam? There's, there's stuff already out there, but they did change the mill spec, I think, to accommodate some of these these foams. Um, they're considered safer, but they're really not. They're they're just as equally dangerous to firefighters. Uh, most AFFF was no longer manufactured with PFO and PFOS. It's replaced with Gen X or some other man-made chemical. So we know for a fact that PFHXS is a replacement to PFO. So while manufacturers are saying, hey, we no longer put PFO in our product. Okay, what did you put in there? Oh, PFHXS or Gen X or something else. How toxic is that? We don't know. We're, we're still doing the testing. Oh, really? So they, they don't even know if that's even going to be better or worse. Or, well, it's yeah. Or, I mean, it's, it's again. What's the normal PFAS level? Zero. Zero. So anything above zero is considered harmful to the yeah. human body. So <laughs> um, these so, manufacturers will say, "Oh yeah, this you know." Well, it's not a PFAS, but it's a different chemical, and then it might be yep, able to do the same it. thing. Basically. Yep. Yep. Here. So this is this is something interesting as well. Some green fluorine-free firefighting foams are still considered toxic. Now, when I say green, there's green screen that has come out and done independent testing. It's, it's a it's a third-party company. They test these foams and they say, okay, these foams don't contain PFAS, PFOA. They're green. They're safe for the environment. Okay, but what we found is they still contain other toxins that are in it. So while they're not looking for PFOS, PFOA, they're not looking for these other toxins like 1,4-dioxane. Has anybody ever heard of 1,4-dioxane? No. It's nasty shit. It's banned in California and uh, New York so far. It's a likely human carcinogen. And we know it was in there because on the 2021 NDAA by National Foam, it was there. But somebody made a phone call to National Foam and said, hey, why does your product have 1,4-dioxane because it's, a, it's banned in California? Oh, shit, we gotta take that out. So the following year, the safety data sheet, it magically disappeared. Is the product still in there? Very likely. But again, this is the whole time when- So you have to test for it to see if it's- You gotta happening. test for it. So as the transition to a safer foams became more and more prominent, they're like, oh, we got to take that out because that, that could be a, an influence to us getting a phone contract. So probably no matter what we get, it's still going to be toxic. Yes, because even the non-coordinated foams, they have detected trace amounts of PFAS in it. Um, not, not a lot, but it's still there. So if it's, I, I look at it this way, if it's a man-made product, it's harmful, you know. It's you know, should we go back to protein foams, fish heads, guts? It just because it stinks, you know. But it's it's natural, you know. It's but, yep, it works. Um, fluorine free foams. They don't produce the same barrier film as HFF. Uh, blanket of bubbles above the fuel requires more. Like I said earlier, uh, it's a denser foam blanket. Uh, may require the apparatus to be reconfigured. Again, that viscosity, we've talked to some manufacturers, they're like, yeah, this stuff's not gonna work. Uh, training, like I said, it's, it, it's gonna take a while uh, for folks to get used to it. it it's, not got, it's not a plug and play. Don't expect to go out there, light up the pit and apply it and think it's gonna, it's gonna be the same. Well, they probably wouldn't let us use it either. They, they very well may not. They very well may not. Um, and again, that industry trade secrets, and, and I've actually seen that on some of their products and safety data sheets. They list right on their doo doo industry trade secrets, trade secrets. They won't divulge anything. Um, 
you guys know about the mutual aid agreements, right? This was for, these slides were for folks that, that weren't familiar with it. So this, this mutual aid agreement came out not too long after, or not too long after I retired. We had, this was being developed while I was still at ACC. Shaw Air Force Base had a tanker fire just outside, um, not too far from, from their, their, their site. They took some foam out. Uh, big concern was if Shaw provided the foam, who's responsible for the cleanup? So they developed these mutual aid agreements to say, hey, we'll gladly give you the foam as long as you sign these agreements exempting us from any liability and everything. So we'll give you the foam. Now you're responsible, local fire department, for the cleanup. Air Force is not. So I had going through that right now all right. with Cobb County. Okay. Their lawyers are looking at overboard. Yep. Okay. <laughs> yep. So it's holding up with the signing the mutual aid agreement with Cobb County. It's, it's, it's in the lawyer world. Yeah. I've, I've had many civilian fire chiefs call me up. They're like, should I sign this? I'm like, I'm not an attorney, but if I was in your position, I would not because the cost of cleanup. We had, we had a foam incident up in PA. 10 gallons of foam was used uh, for an incident. So far, the cleanup cost is $600,000. So that's why fire departments are draining their Class B foams. They're locking out the trucks so you can't even accidentally discharge it. They're like, we're getting rid of this stuff. We don't even want it. We don't even want to be near it. Um, so it's, it's, it's highly expensive to, for the environmental cleanup. What about Class A foams? Are they the same way? Or? We haven't found really too much with them. They're, they're safer, but again, they're, you know, you can't so use them on a class B, so. Yeah. Um, but they are finding. Well, they, like, they want to put it on the pumpers, the class A's. Yeah. So, I mean, because we have, we have tanks for them mm -hmm. on there. And, yep. you know, they actually have the, uh, the, the cast system so that, you know, it basically aerates inside the, the uh, hose itself, so you don't need to applicate like you right. before. Right. So, and that's how our pumpers are made with two tanks and, and a cap system just for class A foam. But they haven't given us any class A, right? I mean, we, we had some alcohol foam for a while, but it's okay. gone. Um, but we got the E85 tank down at, at, um, at the motorboard, the fuel farm here on base. I'm scared of that thing. If it catches fire, that's yeah. intense fire. We ain't got nothing to put it out. And that's and you're not alone in that. Mm -hmm. you know, especially you look at volunteer fire service up in PA. They've got nothing. You know, we get some nasty stuff rolling through my area up there, and it's like, you know, how do you get up a fire out? You get you get nothing to do it. So PA does have a foam task force, but by the you know, by the time they show up, that you know, that, the hell yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah, it's it's you know, a lot of times it's just like you know, just get a perimeter. You know, try to contain it as best you can, you know, prevent runoff, which is what it is all the time. So that's a triple F. They do, uh, when they wash the decks, mm. they actually activate the foam system. It's getting into the meat potatoes, her and poly four aqua substance. You know, they're synthetic. This one, um, I had it at 10,000. It's jumped up to more than 12,000 uh, different compounds now. It's been around since the 1950s. Um, there's short and long chain. So when we went from a C, C8 foam, that was the long chain. When they dropped it down to a C6 foam, that's a short chain. Same stuff, all they did was take out two fluorine, fluorine compounds. Everything else remained the same. Extremely persistent, does not break down easily. Um, that's why there's such a huge half-life on some of these. So like I said, with the uh, Canon's uh, aquifer system, it's destroyed for eternity. You know, once you once you pollute it, there's no way there's no way it's going to clean. Or it, it will, but it, it's going to take generations uh, for that stuff to break down. That's assuming it's never contaminated again, just like our bodies. That's why we consider these as, as you see here, bioaccumulative. But every exposure it builds up in your body because your body is not getting rid of it fast enough. Mice and lab animals, we can see it's not so much bioaccumulative because they're constantly urinating and defecating. 
more than what humans would do. Um, so they're ridding their body faster of these, of these toxins than what we do. Hmm. Persistence, that's just the... So that's just another, another way to say you drink a lot of water all the time. Well, that doesn't even really flush it because your water's, you know, except in your case. Except my water. Yeah. Um, you know, water still contains PFAS in there. And if you drink too much water, then you run the risk of, you know, dying, dying from that. So it's, yeah, but I mean, just like, you know, it would, it would, like if you're trying to flush something, you have to, you know, drink more water and your body will flush faster. If, more, more than likely. If your body's not compromised. Yeah. Um, well, I mean, but if our body already is compromised, there's nothing we can do about it, right? It's right. Still, still in our blood yeah. system and it's so when, yeah so when you guys get your blood test that's just a snapshot that's what's in your blood think of that's what's on on the surface we have no idea what what our body or organs and tissues have absorbed so for me oh, like my, my PFOS levels are 22.8 22,000 parts per trillion that's 30 years after shenanigans so it's 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 been in there I'll literally die with PFOS in my, in my body um, but again, that's just what's in my blood. That was that was a blood result taken back in 2021. Um, most likely I've been exposed to more PFOS since then, so um, I'm expecting the levels to go back up. So So that's your blood level. That's my blood serum level. So if they do like a biopsy, do they have they done that before? No, like, yeah. No, not yet. Okay. There's there's really nobody doing that unless you demand it. Um, so if you know you're a high risk and you have high levels, you could probably request it say, hey, you know, give me a biopsy of my liver. You know, let me see how much you know, PFAS is in my liver. Uh, they, they could probably do it. It's expensive. Well, what would it even accomplish though, really? It would just show how much PFAS is in your liver, you know, how much your liver has, has absorbed. Um, and so if that, yeah, so if it's, if it's a high level, then you're more likely for a cancer. You're, you're high risk, yeah. 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 Okay. But again, okay. You know, you're, you could, you know, I, right now I'm, That's what I I'm cancer free. You know, I haven't, I haven't been diagnosed with any type of cancer, even though I got 22,000 anti parts per trillion in my body. That doesn't say tomorrow. Yeah. My doc said, hey, Kev, we noticed something on your, your latest lab or, you know, something, boom, now you got cancer. Yeah. So, but, you know, because cancer doesn't show up, you know, come knocking, hey, I'm here. You, you know, it takes 20, 30, 40, 50 years for it to show up. And that's assuming you go to the doctor. A lot of folks aren't going to the doctor um, to do that. Um, so this this half life um, again, it, you hear you probably heard of half life nuclear stuff. Every everything has a half life to it. So when it comes to PFAS um, for like or PFAS, uh, you're looking at uh, about 41 years uh, in soil, five years in a, a little less than five years in the blood cell. So if you take Whatever amounts you have in five years, it should drop in half. If you're not, if you're not re-exposed, re every time you get re-exposed, that half-life clock resets itself because it's bioaccumulative. That's depressing. It, it is. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's I'm not here to depress anybody. You know, this is this is what leadership in the DoD, especially in the medical communities, needs to be talking about. That's and they're not. So well, that's why I'm going, going to, hopefully I go to the conference today. It's going to cost a lot of money to a lot of people. Mm -hmm. And that's probably why they're... Yeah. So this is this typical graphic shows you where sources are, how it gets into the water, gets into the fish, gets into the groundwater. Um, this was New Jersey's graphic. Pretty much every state has adopted uh, the same graphic. So that bioaccumulative, again, they're considered forever chemicals. And that's what the science community has, has deemed it because they're there forever, uh, because of the long half-life. Uh, so again, mine was 22.8 nanogram per milliliter. So when you get your, your blood test, it's gonna be in that decimal. So it, it's nanogram per milliliter. So if you just take that number, multiply it by a thousand, that gives you your parts per, parts per trillion. Um, so for me, if I'm never exposed again, it'll take 62.4 years for that PFAS to get down uh, below the EPA's acceptable uh, daily intake of four parts per trillion. Because they, they just dropped it from 70 to four. 
parts per trillion. That's still too high because it should be zero. But, but that's what the EPA. Yeah. yeah, the EPA is saying, okay, Kev, you can consume four parts per trillion every day uh, by drinking two liters of water uh, every day for the rest of your life, then you should not have any adverse effects. And again, that's bullshit. We, we know it is. So. Uh, but they base it off of a 154 pound male. Um, you know, again, two two liters of water every day. That's what they should have. So they looked at that 70 parts per trillion and said, oh, our numbers are a little little high. Um, we may have, may have not calculated this right. So let's throttle it back to four. Um, so now they'll do some studies and see if four is the right number, and then they'll find out most likely it's still too high, and then they'll throttle it back even more. So. Just a graphic of fish. So as you see, the fish is at the bottom. They're not contaminated. The more and more they consume, uh, they float to the top, turn over, and die. So these are the most common PFAS compounds that are out there. Um, I'm not going to write the read the scientific uh, name, but there's the acronyms. Uh, you guys are probably getting tested for about a dozen PFAS compounds now. Yes. It was was it five on the ten? List? Five on the list. Five on the yeah, list. It wasn't ten. It was five. Okay, so you you you're getting the old test. No does. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> first time. Well, first time they did the test, it was just a generic. Do you have PFAS in your system? And everybody came below whatever the threshold was. This one was more specific and targeted. Uh, was it four or five different? Uh, I don't even know. Uh, well, yeah, see, now I left by the home. But I'm, I'm like at 23.8, whatever the overall score. Yeah. Well, it was eight points or whatever. And I do have prostate cancer, so. Okay, that was the original. They've now upgraded to adding yeah, a few is, more. The PFOS, the PFOS is one. There's a second, yeah. Uh, the last one is here. Chlorinated. This one's not on your list. I don't even ask it how to say these words. This one's an N dash P O F uh, P F O S is the initials on it. Okay. Um, and then because they, they've done different ways of doing their testing as well. First, it was linear. Yeah, we got linear and then branched, and then they they have a total. They take the two, merge them together, and they say, here's what your total PFOS is. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, we got a total number. It's just a all the different PFOSes. Yeah. yeah. And then they yeah. just add it all together and say, this is what your yeah, total, my total size yeah. is 20. Okay. So this, this is the C8 PFO long chain. As you see, this is just the chemical um, makeup of it. You have all these little carbon chains and then your fluorine chain. So when you go from a C8 to a C6, uh, all they're doing is removing two carbons, not two fluorines, as I, I misspoke earlier. So they're just removing two carbons um, from there. These are some of the fast facts on there, where you find it. Teflon, Gore-Tex, cosmetics, grease paints, adhesive, firefighter turnout gear. Um, now with your turnout gear, manufacturers are saying, hey, we no longer have PFOS and PFOA. So what they were doing is they were applying it to the outer shell and to the thermal liner. They were actually spray coating it on there, these, these surfactants. They're no longer doing that, or claiming they're no longer doing it. When did they stop doing that? Some have claimed two years ago, some have claimed last year. Okay, so our gear is still, still bad. Yeah, yeah, so if you, got, if you got gear that's 10 years, you know, less than 10 years for manufacture, you, you have it. You're going to have it no matter what because the the moisture barrier has PFAS in it. Because guess who makes your moisture barrier? Three Cortex. Okay. Yeah. Cortex does. So um, there is a manufacturer out there that has designed the moisture barrier the way the way the way Gord does it. It's on the outer portion of that moisture barrier of the, the sandwich that they made. This other manufacturer has claimed they've sandwiched it. So they've got two non PFAS layers and then the PFAS layer in between. They said they couldn't make it without PFAS. 
but they sandwiched it to try to prevent that that PFAS from getting to you. And they're coming up with all these you know these these excuses as to why their product is so much better, but it's still there. Um, I had the opportunity in 2007, right after I got to, to Langley, um, um, who was it? Globe, Globe Manufacturing, took a, took a bunch of us on a tour. We actually came down here to Atlanta, went and toured the Tankati facilities, and then they flew us up to Pittsfield, New Hampshire, up to the manufacturing site, which is probably smaller than what your fire station is. Um, when we came down here to Tenkati, they took us from the raw fiber. Uh, we watched it go from the raw fiber all the way to where they, they wove the fabric. What was interesting at the raw fiber facility was there was bales in black bags. Um, and we, we weren't allowed to take any cameras in with us. And I'm like, well, what's in the black bags? And they're like, oh, it's the raw fiber, but it has uh, Kevlar mixed in with it. And at the time, it didn't dawn on me, Kevlar contains PFAS. Kevlar breaks down in sunlight. So that's why they, they had it in the black bags is to keep the, the, UV from the UV from affecting it. So it's like, okay. So then we get over, they take everything, the fabric, then we get over to the dyeing facility. So if you pick a color, whatever, if you want pink turnout here, they put it in these huge vats, these washing machines. Throw the pink dye in there, tumble it around, now you have pink turnout here. Everything comes out, everything originally is like the, the tan colored uh, gear. And whatever color you want, then they add everything to it. It doesn't do anything to the gear, it's, it's just a dye. Uh, high, it's supposed to be a high heat resistant dye. What we found out was through research, that's where they were applying the PFAS, all the surfactants. They put the gear in there and they would soak it. So instead of spraying it, they were soaking it. So that was all your surfactants. So as we're walking through this facility, we didn't know it at the time, they were putting all this PFAS on there. So it's like, oh, that's interesting. So, but now, uh, a lot of the manufacturers have come out and said, hey, we stopped applying it to the outer shell and the, the thermal liner, but it's still moisture bear. So you're still gonna get exposed to it. Um, this is PFHXA and stain resistant fabrics, carpets, food uh, packaging. Again, there's no federal toxicity values for cleanup standards. This is Gen X um, that's starting to come out now. Um, Firefighting foam, outdoor fabrics. You're starting to see the, the similarities here. So what's interesting with this, it's manufactured since 2009 by Chemours. That's a division of DuPont. So DuPont, as you know, got sued um, for millions uh, again. But what they did is, oh, we got sued. Well, let's go ahead and create an offshoot of our company, Chemours. So if anything happens, it's the offshoot. It's not DuPont. It's still an umbrella company, but Chemours was the manufacturer. That's what these manufacturers do. They, they create these different branches, try to eliminate themselves from liability. But yeah, they're, they're still sued that company into nothing, and they just let yep. them die. Here's PFOS Legacy. Scotch Guard. Uh, so if you've ever sprayed anything with Scotch Guard, you've come in contact with PFOS. Pesticides. Um, yeah, that, that's a big one aside from the other nasty stuff that's in pesticides. Um, ant bait traps. If you put those around your house, that's got PFOS in it. So yeah, that's why you don't want your kids no on the ant baits or your cats or anything like so that. Good policies. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, so what's interesting with PFOS, it's been detected in the wildlife. So they did studies up, up in New England of deer, they found PFOS in it. Why do you think that happened? Water. Water, yeah. water, yep. Contaminants, the vegetation that's up. If you go out in the farm fields, you're eating the vegetation with the sludge that contains PFOS, and now the, the wild deer have it. Here's the PFHXS, that's a replacement to PFOS. Uh, we've also found it's a replacement to PFOA. Um, again, firefighting foam, repellents. When did they first start using PFOS uh, material? I mean, when did they, when did they come up with the 
Like what year? Do you think? 1948 has been manufactured. So, so it's 1948. 1948 has been manufactured in multiple. Whatever they decided to use, yeah. Somebody invented PFOS and said, hey, let's put this surfactant in whatever yeah. product. So, so it's been around since. So but it's been around since we've all been born. Oh, yes. Yeah. Okay. Yep. Uh, PFBS. They're finding that in drinking water, wastewater, surface water, your floor wax. How many times have we waxed the stall floors, or not stall floors, but the uh, truck, truck you know, all that stuff. It's colorless liquid that's been around since 49. So a lot of these chemicals have been around for quite a while. Mm -hmm. uh, here's your PFNA, greaseproof coatings. If HPA, you start to see those numbers come up. That's been around since the 50s. That's fluorine. Um, so our C6 compounds safer than C8. Now, uh, C6 compounds may be five times more toxic to marine life than C8 compounds were. So it's, you know, while manufacturers are saying, oh, this is a safer foam, this is a safer product. No, that's not because they're adding, they're repl they replace some chemicals in there with something else. What are those unknown toxins uh, that are in there and they're not telling us? Jesus. Um, again, here's your national foam safety data sheet. This is green, 3%. This is an alcohol resistant synthetic foam. Uh, there's your acute toxicities, 10 to 20, 10 to 20, 30 to 40. Yeah, there's, like I was saying earlier, exact concentrate withheld due to trade, trade secret. They're not required to tell you because if they divulge that, that gives their competition an upper hand. So they're, they're using the legal loopholes to their advantage. Meanwhile, we're all getting exposed to it. We're getting sick. We're paying the price. We're paying the price, yep. They're making billions every day, you know, and we're, we're out here getting sick off their products. Here's the half-lives. Um, so again, that's that's me, 22,800. Currently 51. Um, if I'm no longer exposed to it, um, when I reach 113, I'll be good. Uh, I'll be good to go. <laughs> yeah. and I'll be celebrating. Yeah. I have a question on that. So yeah. you're at 22 of 20 with all the PFASs around us, you know, in our food, water, clothing and stuff like that, when will those numbers start deteriorating? I mean, I haven't been exposed to foam in four years. You know, uh, good question. And my number is right there. 20. Yep, it's right there. So again, that's at, at four parts per trillion or 0 .004 nanogram per milliliter. So that's what the EPA currently says you can be exposed to every day for the rest of your life and no expected health effects. So if you start out with that, that that uh, 22, um, after 72 years, if you're exposed to it, every about every 4.8 years, um, at 72, your levels will go to 0 .008. Um, and then after 115 years, then they start stabilizing. So there, there's going to be a time frame. If you're never re-exposed, it's gonna take some time for it to swoop down and decline. But then if you continuously get re-exposed to 4,000 parts per trillion, it'll stabilize. It'll never go below below that number. You'll, you'll always have that number in your system. So that's why it's considered forever. You're, you're never going to get rid of it. Unless you're never exposed, and that's the reality is that's never going to happen. in the woods for the rest of your life. Well, uh, yeah, but again, yeah, wild animals are found in the woods, you know, so, yeah. Um, so here, if, if you take that lab mouse that's never been exposed and you start exposing that, that mouse, um, uh, as you see, after, uh, about 67 years, they go to eight parts per trillion, um, and then, uh, about 115 years, uh, it, it levels out. Off the deck, scrub the deck, um, hangers, they dump the hangers. You know, clean that out. Why? Because it's a great degreaser. You know, so why not use it? 
So there you see non-firefighters out there, no PPE. Uh, what's interesting is every one of those individuals would not be eligible for the, the PFAS blood test by the DOD, even though they're exposed. Because if you read the 2020 NDAA, you have to be an individual that's identified as a firefighter, per the... All of our, all of those are firefighters. Spark, yeah. Nope. Well, well, that's, 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 cool. that's why we they're don't get houses trained. duty pay. Yep. They're all trained, yes. They're, they're all they're trained, yeah. but your classification has oh. to be as a damage controlman. Yes, they would be able to get tested. But these individuals that are tasked to get out there and support, nope. Hmm. Your fire truck mechanics, you're not firefighters. But yet they deal with foam all the time when they work on the system. Your hangar, Suppression system technicians, they're not firefighters, but yet they're working on a system that contains foam. They can't get blood tested. We're working to change that as we yeah, speak right, right now. That's like lawsuits coming Oh, it is. Everywhere. Absolutely it is. Oh. Now, like I said, put this in the laptop. The first 10 pages are just nothing but lawsuits. Yeah. Contact Jerry and Jerry. They're going to sue the government for everything. So you guys are you guys know what high expansion foam is. So the upper left was Marine Corps Air Station Putem over in Okinawa. That was about a year or two years ago. Had a hangar system over there. They brought in a team of Marines. Uh, they were in transit. They put them in a hangar. Forgot to turn the fire the suppression system off. Infrared system activated because they had a open flame barbecue grill inside the hangar. Marines, you know, they're hungry. Activated the system, about 50, 60,000 gallons of H or, uh, high expansion foam dumped, 35,000 gallons of finished foam found its way off the installation. That was the foam, the bottom right was the foam cloud, caught on YouTube video, going down through the neighborhood. The military base never even notified the, the locals that, hey, we had a foam activation and it got off the installation. Um, the this was the vault that was supposed to contain the foam. Nobody had drained it. They had a lot of rain um, <clears throat> before that. That had filled up. Nobody ever drained the vault, so it just pretty much bypassed that vault. Got into the local area. Those were all Marines that were tasked to clean up the contaminated soil. Uh, there's very few wearing any type of PPE gloves. So now they have contaminated soil on their hands, their uniforms, their boots. Most likely they took it back to wherever they're staying at and cross-contaminated everything there. So, and they would not be eligible for a blood test either. Typical consumer products, like I said, carpet, carpet cleaning, your food packaging. So you go out, stop down at the hotel bar, Last night, got some fish and chips. He hands me this container. I'm looking at it, I'm like, and I do this everywhere I go. I, I hate doing it. So I'm looking at the container, and you can see the little sheen on the inside of the, the packaging. Yeah, it's fiberboard packaging. Oh, PFAS. Yeah, it's got it's like a waxy coating in there. I'm like, yep. Yeah. So uh, cosmetics. A lot of women don't realize that your waterproof cosmetics has PFAS in it. Keeps it keeps it from uh, you know, coming off. Uh, car seats. They've done studies on these. They found that lower value car seats have higher levels of PFAS than the higher priced car seats do. Uh, is that by intent? Who knows? Uh, nonstick cookware, I see this all the time now. They're putting, you know, nonstick cookware does no longer contains PFAS. Okay, what does it contain? Oh, it contains Gen X or PFHXS. But because nobody's looking for that, they're not talking about it. Again, that stain resistant carpeting. There's the PFHXS. Um, Lowe's and Home Depot claim they stopped selling PFAS lace carpeting, but again, what's, what did they replace PFAS with? There's the car seats. Yeah, car seats under 100 bucks contain either PFAS or some other flame retardant. And that, that's a big thing. A lot of these flame retardant sprays, uh, waterproof uh, sprays. You put either on your clothing, boots, uh, fabrics that contain PFAS. Wow. Uh, yeah. <laughs> they were just talking about that, um, like the contaminant um, Starbucks yep. coffee cups. 
Yep. The inner lining with the hot coffee, you could, you know, the water mm-hmm. stays and it melts. Yeah, there was chef talking about that. Yep. And I, and I think I talk about it in here, but when you heat certain PFAS chemicals, if it doesn't destroy it completely, as they get hotter, they emit other PFAS compounds. They break down into other PFAS compounds. So, um, yeah, so here, 56% of the dessert bread wrappers they tested um, contain PFAS, sandwich and burger wrappers. That's why McDonald's and uh, Burger King got sued was because of their wrappers, the paper wrappers uh, contain PFAS. I remember Canada Air Force Base every, after every ship had a damn BK right next to the door. I'd stop in there, grab my two croissants and a cup of coffee, and now I look back at it, I'm like, holy shit, no wonder I got PFAS in my body. You know, it's, um, these are different, different uh, containers. That's actually the container that I was given last night uh, at the bar. So, and Uline, they may or may not know about it, but they should, they're selling a product. You know, I'll put a disclaimer on there. This is interesting as I pick up my bottled water. It's been found in many bottled water, PFAS. Uh, the worst was uh, 365 Whole Foods brand uh, water. So again, what's an acceptable level? Zero. Yeah, that's what, you know, the expiration date on the water bottle isn't expiration on the water, it's water, but expiration on the plastic. So like, when it starts to break down. Yeah, yep. And again, how many times did we deploy bottled water sat out in the sun? So yeah. Again, so all these PCBs, all the PFAS in there, it's heating up, getting into your water. Yeah. You know, it's, uh, it's the only water to drink. Yeah. Yep. So there you see uh, it went from none detected to 137 uh, parts per trillion. That's 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 huge. Here, uh, garden fertilizers. Like I talked about before, all the biosolids, the sludge that you get. They're starting to put it into different different types of uh, fertilizers. Whether it's industrial, they spread on the farms, or what you get it at your Lowe's, Home Depot, or Garden Center. Um, they're finding it in there. Is what it about it? aluminum water bottles like this? Uh, don't know yet. Haven't seen any, any testing on that. No. Um, but the water, we know the water contains PFAS. Well, not mine. I'm a plumber. I've got five stage uh, filtration system for my water. For PFAS? In, in, including a uh, a uh, reverse osmosis. Okay. It isolates everything except for the water molecule itself. So have, have you had your water tested for PFAS? Yeah. Well, I've had it, well, I've had it tested. It's, it's extremely low parts per million. Okay. You know, but I mean, I've got a filter that's designed to catch VOCs before it even enters into the uh, reverse osmosis. Okay. Your reverse osmosis is basically a filter that has such a small hole that only lets the water molecule itself through, um, and, and it flushes everything else out. Gotcha. Okay. So, um, but no, but I will actually try to find a, a way to test because I mean the molecule itself is not small; it's, it's bigger than a water molecule, right? 